Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I suppose. Uh, welcome to uh, One Chance You Lane's webinar this week. Um, so today you've got John Bryant, who's going to be talking to you about resulting trusts and common intention constructive trusts as well. And then I will be speaking about some recent cases on the solicitor's lien. We hope to get everything, including questions and answers, covered in an, about an hour, um, possibly a little bit less if we... Um, if we manage to do that. Um, if you've got any questions that you want to ask us, please do use the Q&A function. We're, we'll keep an eye on that and try and uh, pick anything up either at the end or, or during the course of our talk. And um, I'm going to share my screen now for John's slides. Over to you, John. Thanks very much, Zach. <clears throat> Morning, everybody, or afternoon, strictly as Zach pointed out. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about the resulting trusts and what they are, the uh, presumptions that the court might apply to negative a resulting trust. Um, then I'm going to deal with um, constructive trust, but in particular, and really only, uh, what are called common intention constructive trusts. And then we'll look at the differences between the two and whether or not the differences uh, really matter. So uh, starting off with resulting trusts, first of all, uh, what is a resulting trust? Well, you, you're probably um, aware of this, but there are three situations. Um, one where A, the set law gratuitously transfers the legal estate in property to B, and the question arises, is A intending to make a gift to B, um, or is it A intending that B should hold the legal estate on trust for A or somebody else? The second situation is where A contributes to the price of property that's purchased by B. So B takes it in either B's sole name or in the names of B and A together. And then again, one's asking, is A intending to make a gift to B um, or intending that um, B should hold on trust for each of them or for both of them? And the third situation, um, which I'm not going to deal with in any great detail, is where A on an express trust transfers property to B, intending um, B to hold on trust, but for some legal reason the trust fails. In that case the property uh, results to A and A retains beneficial title. So looking at the first situation where there is a gratuitous transfer of the property from A to B, all the time we're asking well what was A's intention? And what was it? It was A's intention, not B's. And if the court at the end of the evidence is able to say, well, we know now what A's intention was, then the court will give effect to it. But if at the end of the evidence, A can't, uh, the court can't decide what A's intention was, it will presume that A intended to retain the beneficial interest and not to make a gift um, to B. And this beneficial interest is said to spring back to A. Um, the Latin word for it was resultare and hence the word result. This is a resulting trust because the interest comes back to A. And as one New Zealand judge uh, said some years ago, it's based on what he called the solid tug of money. In other words, uh, A has handed over money, um, but not intending to lose it. So that is the first situation. The second situation where A contributes to the purchase price 
of property that B takes, uh, which B takes the legal title. If A has contributed um, an equal amount as B, then of course they will have equal shares in any event. But if A has contributed in an unequal uh, share to B, either greater or less than B's, then again, if A's intention at the end of the evidence cannot be ascertained, then B will hold uh, a sh A's share of the property on a resulting trust for A in obviously proportion to the amount that A contributed. The third situation is where there has been an express trust and that trust has failed. Um, perhaps A gave property to B to hold on trust for the children of uh, B and then uh, B dies perhaps without any children and the trust fails. A resulting trust will arise now it's said by McGarry in Vanderbilt a number of years ago that it arises by operation of law but in a later case of West Deutsche if we could have the next slide Zach thank you um, Lord Brown Wilkinson uh, doubted that this was an automatic trust what he said was that resulting trusts are regarded as giving effect to the common intention of the parties. The resulting trust is not imposed by law against the intentions of the trustee, as in a constructive trust, but gives effect to his presumed intention. Now there are a couple of things about that. First of all, this third category, in Lord Brown Wilkinson's view, is not an automatic trust. And indeed, he went on to say that if the gift fails entirely, it will go as bona vacantia to the crown and not result to the set law. And the other thing that causes some academic con uh, controversy about uh, this is that Lord Brown Wilkinson says that it gives effect to the common intention of the parties, whereas traditionally a resulting trust you're looking only at the interest of the giver of the property, the set law, not to both parties. But that's an academic debate that I'm not going to dwell on now for obvious reasons. And I'm not going to say anything more about this third category of trust. So if we could go on, Zach. Um, the resulting trust, as I said, arises from a presumption of law that the donor didn't intend to deprive himself of the beneficial interest in the property. Of course, if there's actual evidence as to what the donor intended to do, then one doesn't need the presumption at all. So if there's actual evidence that the donor A intended to give the property to B, then the court's going to give effect to that intention and to say that this was a gift and not a resulting trust. Similarly, an example is re Sharp. A might have handed over the money to B on loan rather than as a gift and again if it's a loan it, there will not be a resulting trust there will simply be a debt so the presumption of a resulting trust can be rebutted by actual evidence including parallel evidence one of the other ways in which it can be rebutted is by what the <coughs> lawyers call the presumption of advancement. Now this, 
um, is historically um, a little difficult in that if there is no evidence of the settlor's intention at all, the court might still say, well, there's no resulting trust because this was a situation where the donor was giving money to either and traditionally a child or to uh, his, and it was always his wife. And in those circumstances, the court presumes that the donor intended to give the money to the child or intended to give the money uh, to his wife. Traditionally, it was always the father uh, who, uh, against whom the presumption of advancement was made and not the mother. And similarly, it was the husband and not the wife. And the historical uh, context is, is very important in this. You've got to look at the history. Uh, the presumption of advancement is really the obverse of undue influence. In other words, the courts were keen to allow gifts from, say, fathers to sons. And so came up with the presumption of advancement. They were not so keen to see gifts from sons to fathers and balked against that and so developed the doctrine of undue influence. Um, and that is uh, said in that case of re-Pauling. The presumption of advancement where there is a parent and child and historically it was father and son was based not only on the duty to maintain that the father has towards a, a child, I'm sorry, I said father and son, it's father and child, uh, was based not only on the duty to maintain, but was based on natural affection. And we'll see the importance of that in a moment. It didn't apply historically between mother and child because the mother was not under a duty to maintain her children. It was only the father that was under that duty historically. Uh, that's probably different now. And there's an example in a case called Lascar, which we'll come back to, where uh, a mother uh, provided uh, funds to her daughter and uh, it was held that the presumption of advancement still uh, existed in that sort of case or could do. Now, um, at one time, the presumption from father to child was a very strong presumption and it took uh, strong evidence to rebut it. And it still applies, the presumption still applies, even though the child is adult and financially independent. So it clearly now isn't based solely on the duty to maintain the child. It might still apply where the child is fit, uh, over 18 and financially independent. And that's Lascar. A useful analysis and indeed survey of the cases is found in the case of Wood and Watkin, um, which shows that the presumption is still a strong presumption. It was argued there that the presumption between parent and child is now weak as society has changed. But the uh, judge wouldn't accept that, said the presumption was still strong, but of course was weaker where there is an adult child and uh, even weaker where the child is financially independent. But the important point to remember is the presumption still exists. As for uh, spouses, this was again a strong presumption between 
for a husband and wife and is stated in that uh, 19th century case of uh, Aikin uh, where a husband transfers money or other property into the name of his wife only then the presumption is that it's intended in a, as a gift or advancement to the wife absolutely the strength of that presumption now over years has become much diminished and uh, you will all be aware of the case of Pettit which is the source really now of the common intention constructive trust or one of them and in uh, Pettit uh, Lord Reed uh, said that the uh, presumption was now um, much weakened and indeed in that case uh, the House of Lords refused to apply it so we've come to the point where the presumption still exists but is much weakened and Lord uh, Newberger in Stack and Downden said in terms uh, that it had not yet disappeared. Parliament uh, has provided that the presumption should disappear in the Equality Act section 1991 which simply says the presumption of advancement is abolished. Now you might think that's the end of that but I'm afraid not because although it was passed in 2010 this section of the Act has not yet been implemented and will be implemented by order at some time or so it seemed but it hasn't been yet and it may well be that it won't um, there wasn't much debate when this section was introduced or, or um, in the bill and not much debate at all when it was passed and uh, I think people have been having second thoughts about it particularly in respect of parents and children might well abolish eventually the presumption between spouses but perhaps not between parents and children and one can see that um, a gift from a parent to a minor perhaps ought to uh, entail a, a presumption that uh, this was indeed a gift and that the child wasn't going to hold on trust in any way so that's the presumption of advancement. Um, I'm now coming on to constructive trusts <clears throat> and really the common intention constructive trust um, uh, which is uh, really now the foundation of the arrangements between um, husbands and wives and cohabitants living together when they buy property and we know uh, we now have of course Stack and Dowden where there's no express declaration of trust between spouses or between uh, people living as husband and wife when they buy property the court now presumes that their intention, if they take the property in joint names, their intention is that both should share equally. In other words, it doesn't matter what each has contributed at the outset. What matters is their intention that they should, their presumed intention that they should share equally. And in that respect, as is said in Stack and Bowden, equity follows the law. There is a joint tenancy at law. There should be um, an equal share in equity, unless there are circumstances, and the court said they will be rare, 
Although, of course, ever since there have been a number of cases which show that they're probably not as rare as the court was saying, uh, that that will be the default position unless there are circumstances showing a different intention. This, as was said in the later case of Jones and Kernot, which was there really to explain what had been said in Stack and Dowden, this is clearly at odds with the resulting trust because the resulting trust, you look at what uh, each has put in and you say, what they have put in at the outset is what they should get back. The common intention constructive trust presumes that it was a common intention that no matter what they put in, there should be an equal division. And in Jones and Kernot, it was said that this um, idea of uh, equal uh, division is of central importance in a single name case as well as a joint name case. <clears throat> so what's the difference between them? Well both are founded on a presumption or what it might be better to call a starting point. Don't forget that the court has ended up with precious little evidence as to the intention of either party. And so the court somehow has got to start somewhere and uses a presumption. So it's really a starting point. Now, if it's a resulting trust, you're looking at the presumed intention of the set law and the set law's interest is quantified at the outset. If you're looking at the common intention cons uh, constructive trust, you're looking at the presumed intention of both parties. And you're looking uh, not at their intention to create a trust, but their intention to share equally. And if there's not an intention to share equally, all right, then there's going to be an unequal division, but it's still based on intention. Um, it's not based on, uh, it's a on their, their joint presumed intention. It's not based on the intention of simply one of them. And with a constructive trust, as we've seen in Jones and Kernot, the interests might change over time because their interests, uh, their intentions as to the interests might change over time. So where at the beginning they might say, or be presumed to have said, well, there's going to be an equal division. If one of them then pays off, for instance, a huge chunk of the mortgage, it may be, particularly with cohabitants, it may be that there is, that is some evidence that they have decided that their interests will no longer be equal. They will uh, be in proportion perhaps to their contributions. So their intentions might change over time. With the resulting tr trust, it's very difficult to show any later change. The interest is quantified at the outset. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> the resulting trust uh, could potentially arise no matter what the relationship between the parties, um, except now in certainly matrimonial and quasi-matrimonial cases, which is Stack and Dowd and, and Kernel. In um, <clears throat> Stack and Dowden, Lord Carr said the sensible point, the starting point, is to look 
where you've got an arm's length transaction at a resulting trust. So he considered that resulting trusts would arise where the transaction was at arm's length. Um, in uh, Lascar, there was a <coughs> domestic situation, but the the court decided that since the property was being used as an investment and not to live in, this was a mother and daughter, they decided, and Lord Newberger was presiding in the Court of Appeal, so perhaps this isn't surprising, because he dissented in Stack and Darden and sought a resulting trust, in Lascar, despite this being mother and daughter and what would seem to be a domestic situation, the court decided there should be a resulting trust. Um, similarly, in um, Wodzinski, there was a <coughs> resulting trust where <coughs> there was a daughter and stepmother who clearly didn't get on in any event and a property so the daughter said had been left to her by her father and she wanted the whole of it um, mother had a claim but this was dealt with on resulting trusts and there is the case of Fazir and Tahir, uh, Fazi and Tahir which was uh, argued by two members of chambers on either side a couple of years ago um, in that case, there was no familial relationship between the parties at all. And, um, and on the whole, it was argued on a resulting trust uh, footing and the court found a resulting trust. So, <clears throat> despite um, what was said in Stack and Darden that it is really the domestic situation where one's going to have a constructive trust. There have been what might look to be domestic situations where a resulting trust has been imposed and indeed in Ma and Collie in the Privy Council where uh, Lady Hale was sitting and Lloyd, Lord Newberger um, and others, but those two had been in Stack and Dowden. What was said there was that you look at the context. In that case, there were uh, two male partners who had been together for some 17 years or so. And together, one was a banker and one was a builder. They had invested in property and made a lot of money uh, out of it. They had a personal relationship as well as a business relationship. And it fell to be decided which side of the line, in many ways, this case fell. Should a resulting trust be uh, presumed or should this be a constructive trust. And what was said by the Privy Council was that first of all, um, the case of Lascar didn't mean that um, it was only in a domestic consumer context that a constructive trust might apply. It could be that the constructive trust might apply in contexts where it was clear from the party's common intention or the lack of it that they should contribute um, in unequal shares, might be their wishes, or it could be that they should contribute in um, uh, equally and 
receive money equally, the context of their intentions, as was said, means much. And you look at the common intention, and that seems to me, and indeed in Gallerotti, these were just friends sharing a flat. Um, no other uh, relationship among them at all except friendship and a common intention constructive trust was imposed in that case and Mar and Colley if I can have the next slide please Zach um, opens the door uh, I think to more and more constructive trusts rather than resulting trusts I said one of the differences between the two is that you look at what is said, uh, what is contributed at the outset in stack with the, in the context of resulting trust, Lord Newberger said there would have to be compelling evidence of a later agreement to change a resulting trust. And if one starts with a constructive trust, Uh, but so I'm sorry, if one started with a constructive trust rather than a resulting trust, one could then look at um, uh, later intention. So the difference does matter as to which the court might impose uh, because of uh, what might happen subsequently to the purchase. The difference does matter. And if I can have the uh, last slide, as we've seen, there may be what I might refer to as non-domestic situations where one could start with a constructive trust. And I think the scope for constructive trusts has been now widened. And I think Mar and Colley, which isn't often cited and perhaps ought to be, um, might have opened the door to that. Well, thank you. That's uh, all I have to say rather hurriedly, I'm afraid, because of time. Um, but if you do have any questions, do let us know. And now I'm going to hand you over to Zach. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, John, for that really interesting um, explanation of uh, the resulting trust and uh, common intention trust. And uh, if John's been talking to us about uh, the effect of the Latin word resultari, uh, and resulting trust. It's, it's my turn to go with medieval French and talking about the Lyon. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the solicitor's Lyon and solicitors uh, traditionally have two types of Lyon that they can rely upon uh, as security for their unpaid fees. They've got a common law possessory or retaining Lyon over documents or other property in their possession and they also have an equitable lien over what have been called the, the fruits of the litigation. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be focusing on that latter uh, right, the equitable lien, and three cases which uh, have judgments been given in the last 18 months or so uh, on equitable liens. But before looking at those cases, I'm just going to remind us a little bit about what the equitable lien is and a couple of the decisions which have perhaps led to a bit of renewed interest in a solicitor's equitable lien. So, so first of all, it's worth reminding yourself of what, what, are, what are the conditions for the solicitor having an equitable lien. So fairly obviously, the solicitor needs to have carried out some work and the client needs to be liable for the fees. Um, VACT is a, a question which has been sort of brought into focus in some recent cases where solicitors are acting on CFAs or damage-based agreements where there is a dispute as to whether or not the client is liable for these and the circumstances. Then we need an identifiable fund to which the lien can attach and there's a causative element. We need to establish that the solicitor's work has in some way contributed to obtaining that fund. If the solicitor does have an equitable lien, uh, there are, are some consequences of that. And in effect, the solicitor has an equitable charge over the fund for their unpaid fees. 
Now, it being an equitable charge, it's a property right, and it's a right which will bind third parties, uh, except bona fide purchasers without uh, the value without notice. And it also bind the debtor um, with notice of lien, so it's capable of binding the other side. And we'll look at a couple of examples of that in a moment. You may be familiar with Section 73 of the Solicitors Act 1974, and that's really what the, the, the statutory basis where the system makes its application to enforce its lien. So you apply under Section 73 uh, for a charging order uh, to uh, over the effectively the fruits of a litigation, the funds, property, whatever else, uh, the lien is subject to the lien, and the court can, can grant a charging order. And it's, it's said that that statutory right to make the application is, is really a, a, a duplication, doesn't add anything to the solicitor's equitable lien, uh, which the courts had established in the cases in the, in the 18th and 19th century. So to mention two cases which really brought the solicitor's lien into focus recently, the first is the case of uh, Khan solicitors, and that was the case that you may recall was one with the Home Office and the solicitor's client between them tried to shaft the solicitors. Um, so the solicitors had done work on a judicial review application, that application had been successful, and the solicitors wanted their fees, uh, some nine and a half thousand pounds. At that point, Mr. Chifun Tui uh, became a litigant in person and he negotiated with the Treasury solicitor to receive the sum of six thousand pounds directly. Uh, Khan solicitors wrote to the Treasury solicitor saying that uh, they shouldn't be passing up money to the client and that they uh, needed to deal with them, uh, but nevertheless the Treasury solicitor paid over six thousand pounds to the client. And what the Court of Appeal said was that whilst the settlement was binding, uh, because Mr. Chifuntwe was now in person, the Khan solicitors had a lien over that fund uh, and the Treasury solicitor, the Home Office had notice of the lien and were bound by it. And therefore the payment over to Mr. Chifuntwe uh, was ineffective until they would paid off Khan solicitors. Uh, which was the, the, the full amount for costs. Uh, Gavin Edmondson solicitors is uh, a, 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 the first time that the questions about the solicitors lien reaches the um, Supreme Court or the House of Lords, the highest court of the land, first time that that court had to make decisions about it and that concerns uh, insurers in a personal injury cases uh, who are trying to shaft the solicitors. Um, so you may be familiar with the road traffic accident protocol. It provides for solicitors to get fixed fees on small value uh, road traffic accidents. And what had happened there was that Gavin Edmondson solicitors were acting uh, on no win, no fee paid basis for a number of the clients. They put their claims into the portal and then the insurers dealt with the clients directly, settling the claims, paying the funds over to the client for their, um, their general damages, but without any provision for costs. And the question there was whether the solicitors could uh, get their costs and the House of Lords held that the insurers were uh, on notice of the lien and therefore the payment to the clients um, was not one which discharged the lien and so the insurers had to pay the solicitors up to the amount of the solicitors costs or the uh, amount paid over to the client whichever was the lower. So going to look then at three cases um, this afternoon uh, which have been decided recently um, all just concern the solicitors equitable lien as I've said some of what I'm going to be talking about was not essential for the decision. Quite a lot of the points uh, that the judges discuss uh, are obiter for one reason or another, um, but nevertheless potentially interesting to those uh, who have got disputes about solicitors' liens, um, are trying to resist them, trying to impose them. So you'll see there's two cases involving Candy um, and one case involving Reece Smith. So the first case is Candy and Crumpler, and that's a Court of Appeal case. And the two questions that that case raises really relate to the waiver of the solicitor's lien. So firstly, what's the test 
for waiver, especially when a solicitor takes some new security for their fees? And secondly, how is that test affected if the client obtains independent legal advice before entering into the arrangement? So a little bit about the facts. Uh, Candy had acted for a BVI company in multi-jurisdictional litigation concerning a boutique hotel chain. Candy and the client had entered into a fixed fee agreement at one point, uh, which purported to grant Candy fixed and floating charges over the client's assets, including anything they recovered from the claims. Um, in due course, uh, Candy's client was wound up in the insolvency proceedings, uh, but it wanted to assert its lien over the, the fruits of the litigation, such as they were. So, first of all, the uh, Court of Appeal deals with the uh, waiver question in general terms. So, waiver, we probably already know, it arises from unequivocal representations by word or conduct that a person is forgoing rights that they are aware they have or aware of the facts giving rise to those rights. So, it's the, the unequivocal nature of representation uh, with knowledge of the fact uh, that you're waiving your right. Um, what can arise in, in, in cases is, is that by if you've got a debtor who owes you money and you've got security for that debt, if the debtor grants you new security, then the question is going to be, do you waive the old security by taking the new security, um, or do you intend to have both? The solicitor's position, uh, so the solicitor has the equitable lien on the one hand, and now perhaps enters into uh, a mortgage over a property, a house, or in the case of uh, Candy and Crumpler, uh, fixed and floating charges over the company's assets. Um, what's the intention behind, uh, is, does the solicitor intend to retain the lien in those circumstances? Undoubtedly, the cases showed that the solicitor was vulnerable to waiving the lien uh, by reason of the fiduciary nature. Um, and before we got onto the question of, well, what is the test that we apply for waiver because the solicitor is a fiduciary, uh, Candy wanted to run the argument, well, there's no waiver here because the company had taken independent legal advice before it entered into the fixed fee arrangement. So can the inference about waiver be avoided by the taking of independent legal advice? And the Court of Appeal say no. The reason for that is that the question of waiver depends on what is the solicitor's intention. Does he intend to rely on his equitable lien as well as uh, his security interest? Um, and the independent advisor is in no better position to know that uh, than the client is. So simply providing a client, ensuring a client gets independent legal advice does not avoid the question of waiver on the part of a solicitor. So what then is the test uh, where a, solic a, a solicitor takes uh, a new security? Um, of waiver for the equitable lien. And it should be, I should say that before this case, there were cases or, or dicta at any rate where uh, judges had said that if a solicitor takes any new security at all, that would waive the equitable lien unless it was expressly preserved. Uh, what the Court of Appeals say is, is that actually the question is whether or not the new security is inconsistent with the old security. And if the new security is inconsistent, then uh, there is a waiver of the equitable lien. And there is a decision uh, of Mr. Justice Nugy, which suggests that you are more ready to find inconsistency between the equitable lien and the new security because the solicitor is a fiduciary. Um, the inconsistencies that the Court of Appeal found were firstly that uh, the subject matter was the same. So both the equitable lien and the fixed and floating charges covered the proceeds of the litigation. Secondly, there were different priorities in the fixed fee agreement and the deed of charge that went along with it and the lien because it expressly gave a priority to the litigation funder in the deed of charge that was part of the fixed fee arrangement. Um, and the litigation funder, I should say, say had not paid all the fees, only paid the initial fees and uh, uh, it was uh, the balance of the fees that Candy were after. And then the new agreement provided for interest, 
whereas Candy's standard terms had not provided for interest. So those were the three uh, inconsistencies that the Court of Appeal found meant that Candy had waived um, its equitable lien. So the next case also uh, involves Candy. Um, Candy in this case had acted for Mr W uh, in a complicated dispute involving a property investment group. W had ultimately lost the claim and had to pay something of the order of £15,000 worth of damages to the claimants, but the claimants claim to uh, recover rescind share transfers to W was unsuccessful and he was able to retain the shares in the company, the shares in Ton State, under the settlement agreement. The claimants then obtained a charging order uh, to secure their £15 million pounds, uh, debt from the settlement agreement over those shares which Mr W had retained um, and then Candy made its application under section 73 of the Solicitors Act for a charging order claiming that they had a lien over the shares. The first question for the judge was whether or not uh, the damages based agreement was triggered um, by a preservation of the shares. Uh, so were Candy entitled to anything at all because Mr W had retained his shares and the judge found uh, that the DBA was not triggered but because that point was going to be appealed he gave a separate judgment on the Leon issues too and there's quite a lot of questions that uh, the judge tried to address or, or addressed um, on that application so first of all did Candy have a proprietary interest um, in the shares before relief under section 73 was granted so in other words and the effect of that would be was, was when the charging order was granted did candy already have an, uh, uh, some proprietary interest if it did have a proprietary interest had it waived its its interest had it lost its ability to claim the lien by anything done in proceedings by mr w could section 73 even apply to sums due under a damages based agreement and finally, should Candy be refused relief in the circumstances? And the next slide I'm going to put up is um, a, just a quick chronology of the circumstances. And so then you can sort of have a think to yourselves about what you think the correct answers to these questions are. So you see the, the sequence is the 21st of May, there was the settlement agreement. On the 9th of June, there was an interim charging order. On the 7th of July, Candy, on W's behalf, consented to the charging order being made final. Charging order then made final in July. 15th of October, W was made bankrupt. And then finally, uh, the solicitors made their application under Section 73. So the first question, uh, did Candy have a proprietary interest in the shares? And uh, the judge had to confront some decisions which indicated that until the court granted relief under Section 73, the solicitor had no interest in the fund. Uh, and what the judge found that that line of authority or those views were inconsistent with the way that the court of the, the sorry, Supreme Court had decided the Gavin Edmondson case and um, that a solicitor does have a proprietary interest from the moment there is a fund in sight. And in this case, from the making of the consent order on the 21st of May. Next question is, had Candy either waived or lost its priority to the claimant's charging order? So the first point was that Candy hadn't waived its right to a charging order by permitting its client to agree to the final charging order uh, because an asset can be subject to two security interests. So by allowing their client to uh, grant a security interest to the claimants they hadn't done anything as between themselves and the client to waive their lien but the judge said candy had lost its priority to the charging order as against the claimants uh, effectively because they were not on notice as to uh, candy's lien and there's there's two ways that the judge really comes at that one is that the shares the retaining retention of the shares isn't a recovery which the other party would have been on notice that the uh, solicitors might be asserting Leon over 
and the other was that um, the claimants knew that there was a damages based agreement underlying Candy's entitlement to fees, but they couldn't have known that it might be triggered by the preservation of the shares. Um, and indeed, the judge had found that it wasn't triggered by the preservation of the shares. And this whole uh, part of the decision is, is on the premise that the judge is wrong on that particular point. So the, the effect of that was that uh, even if the judge was wrong on the construction of the damages based agreement, Candy still weren't going to be entitled to their equitable lien. So whatever happens on appeal, uh, the remaining questions the judge considered are definitely obita. But let's just have a look at them very quickly. So what, one thing that often happens in proceedings is that everybody forgets that the equitable lien exists. Um, and in this case, um, there were two points at which Mr. W had done something which was inconsistent with the equitable lien said um, Tom State. So firstly, given an undertaking uh, not to dispose of his shares uh, without giving the claimant solicitors in 14 days notice. And secondly, he'd made submissions in the bankruptcy proceedings, which assumed that the claimants had security to the value um, of his shares. And that, that security was good and, and, and not uh, subject to uh, a rival claim by the solicitors. And the court said that firstly, the submissions didn't waive the liens between Candy and the client, which is the point where we're looking for the waiver. And secondly, the undertaking, the terms of the undertaking weren't strict enough because they only required notice to be given uh, to prevent the lien from arising. And you contrast that with the undertaking given in Withers and Ryback, where uh, the undertaking was sufficiently strict that it was inconsistent with the lien arising. Um, so the next question, which uh, is potentially interesting, is could section 73 apply at all to uh, fees due under a damages based agreement? And the wording, uh, of section 73 which is in question are the words assessed costs so it said well these aren't assessed costs these are sums due under damages based agreement uh, and the judge said the damages based agreement fees could be treated as assessed costs because there are decisions on section 73 which treat assessed costs as being the equivalent of proper costs and and therefore sums due under damages based agreement um, are recoverable then finally, um, the question of discretion, section 73 relief is discretionary, um, although what we have seen in a number of decisions is that the courts are very reluctant to refuse a solicitor relief who's otherwise entitled to it um, on the basis that it's an equitable jurisdiction and it needs to be, uh, the, the discretion needs to be exercised on principle. So apart from something like lay cheese or unclean hands, uh, relief shouldn't be refused. There was an abusive process argument because the point hadn't been raised earlier that the judge said well this isn't sort of a Henderson and Henderson type abuse process because the fees weren't an issue until the solicitors made section 73 application. What the judge didn't do though is give his views on the fact that the solicitors had allowed their client to consent to the final charging order so we don't know what his view about that was. Now, the final case um, I've got to talk about uh, is Rees Smith, um, which is a, a, a complicated affair and uh, it involves two personalities called Mr. Smith and Mr. Ruhan. And I'm going to try and just do a new share to show you my, uh, if I've got it, actually, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to bother with that actually it's, it's, it's going to be too, 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 too much tech for me i'm going to try and try and show you my my flow chart of how complicated this all was um, but in effect stewards of the solicitors here they are acting for the orb claimants who are on dr smith's side on a cfa and the whole dispute arose when dr smith had stolen money from a company and borrowed money from mr ruhan to try and pay it all back and there were two settlement funds. First of all, the Isle of Man settlement. And by that uh, settlement, uh, funds, were funds which were beneficially owned by Mr. Ruhan were transferred in breach of trust to entities controlled by Mr. Smith, um, which he had got by threatening trustees in the Isle of Man with regulatory hell um, because they were acting um, as shadows for 
uh, Mr. Ruhan and uh, would be in a lot of trouble if that was exposed. And then there was the Geneva settlement. Uh, Mr. Ruhan discovers what's happened in the Isle of Man settlement and the Geneva settlement not only settles the litigation, uh, the original litigation between Mr. Smith and Mr. Ruhan, but also settled the issues which arose out of the Isle of Man settlement and the, the breach of trust by the trustees of entering into the Isle of Man settlement. Um, the Geneva settlement had triggered suspicious activity reports by some of the solicitors involved. The SFO had intervened, various parties had become insolvent as a result, and the question was whether stewards could assert an equitable lien against any of the settlement proceeds. Uh, the judge held that they absolutely could not assert a lien against the Isle of Man settlement assets because those were subject to Mr. Ruhan's proprietary claims and the solicitor can't be placed in a better position than the client and the client was subject to Mr. Ruhan's, the client's interest was subject to Mr. Ruhan's interest. Um, on the Geneva settlement, the following issues arose. Firstly, could Stuart's claim assets that went to the Ruhan side parties? Secondly, was there a sufficient causal connection between what Stuart's had done and the recovery? And third, what was the impact of the alleged counterclaim? So you might find it interesting that Stuart's even tried to argue that they could claim assets that had gone to the Ruhan side parties. And the way they argued this was that one of the Ruhan side parties had only discovered that Mr. Ruhan had shortchanged him uh, by reading a witness statement that Stuart's had prepared in the Isle of Man litigation. And they said, well, that's work we've done. Uh, it may be a Stuart, it may be a Ruhan side party, but they've learned that they have a claim against Mr. Ruhan from something that we've done. And uh, the judge said, no, that was not sufficient. Uh, that was too tangential for stewards to be able to claim that that was fruits of their work. The next question then is what is the test for a solicitor who needs to show the connection between the work the solicitor's done and the ultimate fruits of the litigation? And the judge said the test, there is a requirement for but for a but for causation, so you need to show that but for the solicitor's work, the fruits of litigation wouldn't have arisen but it's a test that's to be applied relatively generously and in a pragmatic way. And the way that this was attacked by um, some of Stuart's clients was that some of the work that Stuart's had done had ultimately been entirely unsuccessful. So they'd engaged in, um, made a number of Norwich Pharmacal applications, uh, one of which was overturned because full and frank disclosure about the Isle of Man settlement hadn't been made to the judge. And, um, it was an application which was a notable failure. And what the judge said is that in any commercial piece of litigation, there are often applications which are failures or unsuccessful, but unless those are applications made by the solicitor in breach of a duty to the client, uh, then the client must take the rough with the smooth. And so the, there's no to be no passing of those parts of the solicitor's work which contribute to the recovery and those bits which perhaps don't. Uh, re result in recovery. And uh, to push on with matters, the, the, the judge also found that actually those applications had uh, borne fruit because they put pressure which had actually led to the settlement. And then finally, what was the impact of the alleged counterclaim? Two of Stuart's clients were intimating that they had a counterclaim and very simply, until the counterclaim is established or determined, the solicitor has an extra lien for the full amount of uh, its fees. So that's all I'm going to talk about on the, on the extra lien. Um, next week, uh, we've got Sarah Prager, uh, who's going to be joined by Jose Maria Pimentel Prado, who is a partner at DAC Beachcroft's Madrid office. And they are going to be talking about how to get the most out of your expert. And Signor Pardo uh, often acts as an expert in the English courts giving evidence about uh, Spanish law. So that should be very interesting. Uh, so, so do sign up for that. It's Tuesday next week uh, rather than um, Thursday. I'm going to stop the share now. Um, so I don't think we've got any questions uh, to answer, but if anybody wants to, to type anything away, then please uh, feel free to stick a question in quickly. Um, otherwise, and with John and I will try and answer it, whether it's about solicitors' equitable liens or it's about resulting trusts or common intention trusts, 
um, and we'll stay on the line a bit longer. But other than that, thank you very much for, for joining us today. It's lunchtime. So um, I'll give it a couple of minutes to sit, well, I'll give it a minute or so to see if anyone's typing quickly away uh, with a question for us. But otherwise, um, um, everybody have a, have a great week and enjoy your lunches. Yes, thank you very much, all of you. So I'm, I'm going to ask John a question. John, have you seen um, Mark Holly being cited at all to sort of shift the way that judges should approach the question of um, <clears throat> intention trusts? Well, it, it, it has been cited, but um, I, I don't, I, it was not cited in the Farsi case. Um, and there are some academic um, discussion uh, that one can find about, about that case and that perhaps it should have been dealt with as a common intention, constructive trust. And um, no, Farsi wasn't um, cited and not referred to in, in the judgment. I don't think it was cited, but it was, I might be wrong because the two, two of my colleagues probably yeah. will tread on my toes about this. They might have cited it, but it, it wasn't referred to anyway in the judgment. Um, one has to be careful, of course, because it is a Privy Council decision. Um, but it seems to me a strong decision because of the composition of the committee. Yeah. Um, who were both in, in Stack and Dowd and, um, um, well, Lady Hale was in Stack and uh, Kernot and uh, 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 as well. So, I think it's a case worth keeping in mind. I just feel that what it does is say, well, look, let's keep looking at what we say is the intention of these parties. In other words, don't throw up your hands and say, I can't divine an intention. Let's have a resulting trust. I think the courts are really trying to, to come round to making things a bit more simple with that. And that's what, that's what they've been trying to do, certainly with Stack and Dowden and following. Um, so that in the majority of cases, one can just say, well, this is their presumed joint intention. Yeah. Um, and one, in looking at that joint intention, one can look at subsequent uh, at events subsequent to the purchase. Whereas we've seen with um, with a resulting trust and what Newberger says, it's uh, and he's right. I think you just look at the beginning. So the courts are trying to be a bit more malleable, I think. And I can I can see it being quite useful where you've got two parties who've done lots of deals together, and the first ones there might be some discussion about the basis of the deal, and then they just fall into a pattern where there's no discussion yeah. so you don't have sort of representations you can find proprietary estoppel out of so you've got to tease out a common intention yeah as, as to what they were doing and you look back to the, the previous deals to try and to try and fight tease that out yes um yeah so I mean, the thing about the colleague case is that although there was a personal relationship and a lot of this was for investment. I mean, it was, it wasn't they were going to live together in all of these properties that they were buying and selling. Um, it was in many ways a, more of a commercial venture. The court, the, the Privy Council still said constructive trust. Um, and yeah. so, well, look and see if we can divine the intention. So that's probably now going to be the starting point. 
rather than shouting resulting trust or um, even presumptions of advancement or presumptions of um, what the uh, the the term I'm sorry the, the legal title would be reflected by the equitable title. Let's let's just look and see if we can find some common intention. And that might be now the starting point. Yeah. Well, then it looks like we're not going to get any questions, so um, I'm going to close down the webinar. Thank you, everybody, who stayed to the end, and um, look forward to seeing you soon, John. All right, and you, Zach. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks very much, everybody.